Uh, on Wednesday, Secretary Blinken will depart for his 18th trip as Secretary to the Indo-Pacific region, traveling to Vietnam, Laos, Japan, the Philippines, Singapore, and Mongolia. From day one, this administration has made deepening our engagement with Indo-Pacific partners a top priority. And on this trip, the Secretary will continue to advance our vision of a free, open, and prosperous region. In Hanoi, Secretary, Blin Secretary Blinken will attend the funeral of General Secretary Nguyen Phu Chang and offer condolences to the people of Vietnam. He will further unders underscore the strength of the comprehensive strategic partnership with his government counterparts. In Vientiane, Secretary Blinken will participate in ASEAN-related foreign ministers' meetings, including co-chairing the ASEAN-US and Mekong-US partnership foreign ministers' meetings. The Secretary will emphasize our steadfast support for ASEAN centrality and the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. He will also discuss topics including enhancing our economic cooperation, combating the climate crisis, and addressing the ongoing crisis in Burma. In Tokyo, Secretary Blinken and Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin will join their Japanese counterparts to build on the success of Prime Minister Kishida's historic official visit to Washington in April by participating in a foreign and defense ministerial dialogue to reaffirm the critical importance of the U.S.-Japan alliance. They will also continue to build on the momentum of the U.S.-Japan, Republic of Korea, and U.S.-Japan-Philippines trilateral cooperation. The officials will later hold an extended deterrence ministerial meeting during which they will discuss bilateral cooperation to further strengthen U.S. extended deterrence bolstered by Japan's defense capabilities. Finally, in Tokyo, Secretary Blinken will join his Australian, Indian, and Japanese counterparts for a Quad Foreign Ministers meeting, during which the officials will discuss how our four nations can continue to deliver concrete benefits for the Indo-Pacific region. In Manila, Secretary Blinken and Secretary Austin will meet with their Philippine counterparts for a 2 plus 2 ministerial dialogue. They will reaffirm our nation's shared vision of a free and open Indo-Pacific region and support for adherence to international law and maritime domains. They will discuss ways to deepen coordination on shared challenges, including in the South China Sea, while also advancing our critically important bilateral economic agenda. In Singapore, Secretary Blinken will meet with senior Singapore officials to review the growth of our cooperation on security, economic, climate, and technology objectives. The Secretary will also co-chair the second round of the U.S.-Singapore Critical and Emerging Technologies Dialogue, where the two sides will discuss how to reduce barriers to innovation and increase collaboration while also protecting national security. Finally, in Mongolia, the Secretary will meet Foreign Minister Batsitse to continue the momentum from the first ever U.S.-Mongolia Comprehensive Strategic Dialogue, which the Secretary and Deputy Secretary will host in Washington tomorrow. The two will hold in-depth discussions on our country's growing relationship, as demonstrated by ongoing initiatives to bolster our people-to-people -people ties through professional and educational exchanges, English language programs, and establishing direct flights between our two countries. Uh, we'll have more to share in the coming days as the trip proceeds. I look forward to um, making further meetings and events public uh, as we move along. For that, Matt. Okay. Thanks, Matt. Um, so uh, just more broadly on the trip, and I, I, I think I, in fact, I'm sure I know the answer to this, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Just to get it Was there any consideration uh, after yesterday at, say, 1.45 p.m. as the Secretary pulling this down? No, none at all. In fact, um, this isn't a, a direct answer to the question, but I think it's relevant. So the Secretary convened the senior leadership team of the department this morning to to share a few things with him. One, that he talked to the president yesterday after the announcement, and the president made clear that he is focused on all the work that we are doing, the administration is doing broadly, but of course that we in the national security space are doing. And um, he wants that work to continue full steam ahead over the next six months. And as the secretary shared with the senior leadership team here, we still have an eighth of the president's term remaining. There's a lot of important work that remains to be done. And he expects our team to continue to focus on getting that work done. So we still have an eighth. An eighth. It's a significant, One. significant yeah. amount of time. Okay. It just seems that's unusual to say an eighth. Okay. Eight, fair, eight. Fair, fair, fair enough. Um, and then eight, six uh, months, however you want to look at it. It's uh, 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 in okay. the uh, as you know, things a lot of things can happen right. in six months. Well, I mean, but, but, seriously, there is a lot of work. So no, no, no. We didn't in no way consider uh, canceling the trip okay. because 
the work we're doing in the Indo-Pacific right. is one of our top priorities and it needs to continue. But in some ways, I mean, you could see that maybe even uh, even if it wasn't considered pulling it down, that, that continuing to go or keeping the plan is just as, if not more important, um, to you know to show the administration's commitment. No, um, you keeping it. You leave, I got a little lost in the keeping yeah, it on. Is, is even important. if there wasn't any consideration of pulling the trip down because the president has decided, you know, maybe. It, President decided not to, not to withdraw. Um, I suppose there are those, and maybe I'm wrong, but uh, who could say that it's important for you, for the secretary to go anyway, um, just to show that you know, kind of continuity. Yeah, I'm sure people could make that argument. I would say, from our perspective, we don't really connect it to the president to a campaign decision. We connect it to the fact that the president was elected to a four-year term. We have a number of work left to do in the remainder of that term, and we're going to be laser focused on getting that work done. All right, and then I asked this question earlier today, but I, 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 I do want to know, I mean, on Friday in Aspen, the Secretary said that he'd be planning to see the Chinese Foreign Minister in Laos. Is that actually going to be, is that going to be a, you know, a formal meeting, or is it just like he's going to pass him in the hallway or seen across the table with the dinner or something. So I don't have any meetings to announce today with respect to either Wang Yi or any uh, uh, other officials we may see on the sidelines of the uh, the either any of these meetings. But as you know, when we have been in the, the same place uh, as the Chinese foreign minister on other trips, we have found occasion to sit down with them in one respect or the other, and I would certainly expect that to be the case here. Right. Well, you've also found occasion on some other trips, certainly not all or many, to sit down with the Russian foreign minister. Do you expect something like that to happen? Uh, I do not. Okay. Do Thank not. you. I just follow yeah. up on, was there any guidance that went out to post about how to discuss what happened yesterday in Aldac or anything? No, no, uh, no Aldac has, Aldac has gone, down, gone out as of yet. Um, we may end up sending some guidance along the lines of what the secretary communicated to the senior leadership today. Um, uh, I don't know if we'll make that decision or not, but we do think it is important that everyone in the department here, loud and clear, that the work that we have been engaged in over the course of the past three and a half years remains a high priority and that everyone should remain focused on getting that work done. And then can I switch to the Middle East? Do yeah. you have any updates on the discussions around a hostage deal? Um, Netanyahu said he would send negotiators later this week to continue with the negotiations. Will Bill Burns be there? What can you tell us about where things stand? So I won't make any announcements with respect to the uh, leader of another agency, all my, my typical practice here. Um, but uh, we continue to, to work on it. You heard the secretary speak to this and ask him on Friday where he said that uh, in his estimation, we are inside the 10 yard line, but that of course doesn't mean that we'll ultimately be successful, but that if you look at how far we've come, we have significantly narrowed the disagreements between the parties and, and have a, a few remaining issues that need to be resolved. Now, since Friday, they're not yet resolved. We continue discussions with the, the other mediators uh, and with the government of Israel to try to reach resolution, but we don't uh, we don't have that yet, and I don't have any kind of forecast about when we might come to So you don't anticipate this could be done by the time the Israeli Prime Minister addresses Congress? Um, uh, I'm not going to put, I thought you were going to say uh, when he arrives, and I was looking at the clock because I think he arrives pretty, pretty, pretty soon, like in the next few, hour, in the next few hours. Um, uh, I don't want to put any kind of, uh, of timetable on it. And we'll uh, it's it's it only it's just very difficult to, to predict. Will Blinken have any engagements with that? Yeah, we'll um, I would expect that he would attend the meeting with the president, but um, uh, uh, that meeting's not yet been, been formally announced. Yeah, so. Will with the hostage family as well? Will the the secretary? Yeah. I don't have any meetings to announce today, but as you know, he has met a number of times with the the, the families of hostages, both on our trips to Israel uh, and here at home, and he's met with them ten times, more than ten times. Um, so it has been a consistent priority of his to meet with hostage families and let them know all that we're trying to do to bring their relatives home. But I don't have any announcements to make about meetings this week. Thanks, Matt. Uh, with the Houthi attack on Tel Aviv on Friday, um, our video verification team did, some, did what they do best, and they, they determined that the um, UAV uh, exploded about 200 meters away from the U.S. Embassy branch in Tel Aviv. Um, has there been any uh, discussion with 
the Israelis or any conclusion as to whether the U.S. Embassy branch was indeed a target? Uh, we do not know at this time at least, uh, uh, what the actual target was, which is not to say we have any information to suggest that uh, our embassy branch was the target. We just don't have any actual information about what, what the exact target was. Um, the Israelis, I think, as they publicly announced, have, have said they identified the drone as being an Iranian drone launched from uh, Yemen, who has, of course, claimed responsibility for it. We are in close contact with the Israelis as they fully investigate the source of the explosion and its intended target, but don't yet have any definitive uh, information about that second question. And given the proximity, do you expect, or has there been any change in security posture at that branch or any of the others? Uh, there, there hasn't been. As you, are, I, I think, are probably aware, um, since October 7th, there have been a number of, of, of attacks on Israel writ large and on Tel Aviv. There was a, a while when uh, Tel Aviv was coming under daily attack from rockets from Gaza. Um, and we, since that time, have been very, always very closely monitoring uh, the security situation. We have well-established uh, well protocols uh, at our embassy and our embassy branch office for dealing with threats. Um, we uh, you know, conducted uh, an account accountability after the drone attack uh, on Thursday, I guess it was Friday morning there, and um, established full accountability for all of our personnel and our embassy and the embassy branch office are operating from all today. Yeah, Thank you. I, I just to be clear, uh, you're not expecting the way the Prime Minister to come to this building for any meeting, are you? No. You don't? No. Okay. All right. Now, uh, let me ask you this about the Prime Minister, uh, you know, as an expert, you know, not that I want you to get into it yet. But, uh, what am I an expert I, then? No, you are an expert on this issue, you're an expert for knowing the, the Israeli Prime Minister for sure. You encountered him many times. But my question to you is, would he be less inclined to be cooperative on this deal? You know, I mean, he's opting by nature, but now he may feel that there's, you know, a great deal of disincentive to go ahead with this deal since the, 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 the person who basically, uh, you know, uh, articulated this deal uh, has decided that, that he will not only get run for office. Um, but, so, so expert or not, I try not to put myself uh, in the minds of anyone else, try to, to make assessments about uh, people based on their actions, and I will speak to the actions of the government of Israel, including the prime minister, when it comes to this potential ceasefire deal, and that is that they have continue to stand by the proposal that the president outlined publicly some six weeks or so ago. Uh, we have been engaged with them over the course of the past few weeks trying to bridge the final differences. And what they tell us and what they continue to show is that they are working to try to get a deal. Doesn't mean that they're willing to agree to every demand that Hamas has made. Of course not, that's the, the standard uh, way a negotiation proceeds. But we continue to judge that they are working to try to reach a deal. Okay, so you, you don't feel that uh, a great deal may have changed in, let's say, in what Israel would want or would agree to in, in the last 24 hours or anything like that? No, I do not. And again, I'm going to assess all the parties by the actions they take. Yeah, a couple more questions. Uh, the U.S. Uh, criticized the ruling, uh, the ICJ ruling, uh, that the, uh, the Israeli occupation of Palestine is illegal. Why would you do that? Because you, you guys, I mean, just I want to learn, uh, you are a signatory to 242, 338, and so on, which speak very clearly on, you know, what is occupied yeah. territory and so on. Why would you be opposed to a statement that is taking the obvious, actually, so, that the West Bank and East Jerusalem So if you look out, if you look out the, if you look closely at the response that we gave to people that asked uh, for our take on this ruling on yes. Friday, what we said is that we have been clear that the Israeli government's support for settlements is inconsistent with international law and of course runs contrary to the cause of peace um, and that we respect the role the International Court of Justice plays uh, in the peaceful settlement of disputes but what we are concerned about is that parties will use the court's uh, advice as a pretext for further unilateral actions that will just deepen divisions and make the cause of establishing an independent Palestinian, Palestinian state more difficult to achieve. So we're clear on what we think about the settlement program, and we're also clear about what we think the ultimate outcome ought to be here, which is the establishment of an independent Palestinian state, and that's what we continue to pursue. But, I mean, you, your position is very clear on the occupation, very clear on the pursuit of a two-state solution and so on, and the settlement, all this, but the Israelis are not responding. Now, you continue to say that the, the best or the most 
you know, feasible path forward on this is negotiation. But then we have the, you know, the legislative body of Israel come out and say, you know, we're not going to negotiate on this issue. So why not then, you know, take this matter into some sort of an international forum? Uh, because we believe the best outcome ultimately to establish an independent Palestinian state. And, that, and it's important to remember the practical goal that we want to see achieved. Um, not votes at international bodies that don't do anything, not rhetorical statements that don't do anything. We want to see the actual establishment of an independent Palestinian state. And in our judgment, to get there, it is going to require negotiation. And yeah, it's a very difficult process. Obviously, there's a reason why um, this dispute has been dragging on for decades now. But we continue to push for the establishment of the Palestinian state, and we continue to look at, what, at um, ways to come out of the current conflict uh, and get a ceasefire and build a ceasefire into lasting peace and build a ceasefire into uh, enduring stability and ultimately push for the establishment of a Palestinian state. Not to say that it's easy. Of course, it's not easy, but in our judgment, that is the, uh, uh, the route that has the ultimate best chance of success. Mm -hmm. Lastly, uh, on the, the water, Israel is using water as a weapon, according to different uh, reports uh, in Gaza. I mean, so like water has been cut off by 94 percent. Are you aware of this situation? Uh, I haven't seen that specific report, but I can tell you that we have been working to try and get food and, of course, water into um, uh, the people of Gaza. We have been working to try and get pipelines turned back on. There have been times that Israel has made progress working with local Palestinian uh, agencies to try to get water turned back on, and then you had uh, uh, events that led to pipes being disrupted again. Obviously, the provision of water is incredibly important. That's why, for another example, we've worked to get fuel into Gaza to um, uh, to allow desalinization plants to run so they can provide water to uh, the people who need it, and that continues to be a priority for us. Thank you. Yeah. So, so in your, your response to that, um, you're talking about you, what you don't want parties to use the, this opinion uh, as a pretext for further unilateral action. What, what, what are we really talking about there? What, what, is, what is it in your concern that a court's decision will, will be used as a pretext? So I don't want to prescribe any from here, um, but just as we have criticized unilateral actions that Israel has taken, um, because we don't find them conducive to the goal of um, uh, reaching peace, we would see actions by other parties. So you've seen us, for example, when other countries have come out and recognized uh, a Palestinian state uh, as a unilateral action. It's of course the right of any country to make that decision, but we see that ultimately as harmful to the ultimate goal of negotiating the establishment of a Palestinian state. So without prescribing any, uh, any exact options that various parties may take, it's that kind of unilateral thing that outside the context of negotiations, we just ultimately don't find helpful. Right, I think like what, what, what Saeed was, was kind of getting at, um, if you, you're, you're, you're basically saying we don't, we don't, we don't sort of see this, this court's opinion as useful, but that's not really what courts are for, right? They're not, so they're not there as bodies to make useful political interventions and issues. This is an issue where you say you support international law, but in uh, international law, the, the concept of international law means that there, is, there are courts that can rule on these kind of things, right? And, and now we've got the ICC and the ICJ have both uh, taken actions regarding Israel in, in, in the last few months. And in both cases, you've sort of pretty strongly uh, spoken out about, about the courts, those courts' um, interventions. So, you know, how, how can you say that you support international law when whenever the, the bodies of international so, law acts, you, you, so, you denounce it. So um, various parties or observers to international fora or courts here can both respect a court system and disagree with rulings that courts make. We see that all the time, just thinking about domestically here at home, where an administration can respect the work that the courts do, but disagree with an individual that ruling, ruling that comes down. Um, be concerned about the practical implications of a decision that a court makes, plan to an appeal. They're all, it, it is, I think, keeping in practice with the way people respond to court decisions all around the world. And it's the case here where we can uh, respect the role that the courts play, but also be concerned with the implications of decisions that they make. And when we have those concerns, I think it's incumbent upon us to, to give voice to them. And, but by doing that, you're kind of you're signaling to your ally Israel that it it doesn't need to follow those rulings. Yeah, so this was an advisory ruling, first of all, um, but uh, I think 
what it signals is that when we have concerns, we're going to speak to them publicly. Yeah. A couple of topics. Uh, on also on Moscow, we learned uh, today that last big uh, Russian um, court rushed through her conviction in a secret trial. They, they sentenced her to 6.5 uh, years uh, to prison. Any, any comment? So we remain focused on the case of Alsu Kermasheva. She's a dedicated journalist uh, who is being targeted by Russian authorities for her uncompromising commitment to speaking the truth and her principle of reporting. Journalism is not a crime, as you have heard us say on a number of occasions, and we continue to uh, make very clear that she should be released. Thank you. I'm moving to the second street. Uh, 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 could you explain why it is that she has not been determined to be lawfully detained? I, I don't have any update, only in that, you know, when we're reviewing these matters, I never give kind of readouts on the internal process while they're ongoing, yeah, but, but, we, not, but we, we have not yet made a determination in this case, but we not have yet. called on we have no. called on her to be released. Well, yeah, but not because she's been wrongfully detained. Correct. Right. So that suggests that you think that there might be something to the charges. No, it does not suggest that at all. It, what, well, I what, does it what I think it is an indication of is oftentimes um, there are a number of factors that we have to take into consideration. It sometimes takes longer than people would like, um, but we take it very seriously and we are uh, undergoing that process well, as sometimes we Sometimes it takes very, very little time. I know. The cases can be different um, and have different legal factors that apply to them, but the process is ongoing with respect to her case. Go ahead, no. I'll Follow up on uh, also, so, so, yeah. Um, are you providing... How many yield have you Are you providing any assistance? As long as you don't say reclaiming my time, then it's, <laughs> uh, it's completely the end of Congress. Sorry, Peter. I, now I'm sorry for interrupting. Okay. Go ahead. Are you, is the State Department providing her family any sort of assistance? Um, so whenever uh, a U.S. citizen is detained overseas, we provide consular assistance. Uh, we have talked to um, her family and her attorneys on a number of occasions uh, since she's been with them. And anything you can do from here now, uh, from here on? So I don't want to speak to the underlying dynamics of, the, of this case, but as I said, we continue to call on her release. I'll forward her release. Thank you, Matt. Will, will the last week's decision uh, have to expedite the process in terms of designation? I'm just not going to speak to the, to the internal evidence. Thank you. Thank you. Move to the Secretary's trip. Uh, on particularly the Tokyo leg of the three, uh, on two plus two million. Uh, will there be any uh, discussion in terms of uh, you know, certifying Japanese companies uh, which are you know, in the process of you know, uh, speeding up, and I think they also announced that uh, they're going to produce more uh, patriots. You know, you know, Ukraine is more, and you guys can't provide, so Japan has capabilities. Is it something that is being discussed? Or so whenever stuff? we um, have these types of discussions with our allies and partners, the situation in Ukraine and the need to continue to back Ukraine is is near the top of the list, if not at the top of the list, and that that is um, that's always the case. But I don't want to, to get into what the specific conversations might be before we have them. Obviously, the secretary will have press conferences along the trip, and we'll have readouts on the trip, so you'll be able to see what we talked about, and journalists will be able to to ask them exactly what we talked about in the meetings. Well, thank you. I have one more on a particular drawdown package that, that, that is when you guys announced. Both the State Department and DOD said that the amount was $225 million, right? And, but the presidential uh, you know, memorandum, the secretary, is uh, reflecting $125 million. Can you please clarify which one? I will have to take that back out. So. I have two more SARS conferences, if I may. Um, why don't we go to someone else? You don't get to do seven questions at the top. Please come back to me. <laughs> well, thank if we have time, I'll come back to you. But if you have a South Caucus question, Question. Go ahead, Michelle. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Matt. Uh, do you have any details on the U.S. Iraq security uh, cooperation dialogue that's uh, uh, being held in Washington uh, today, as the U.S. ambassador to Iraq has said? Yeah, so representatives from the State Department, uh, including Deputy Assistant Secretary Victoria Taylor and Ambassador Romanowski, are participating in the U.S. Iraq Joint Security Cooperation Dialogue this week with our colleagues at the Defense Department. This is the second joint security cooperation dialogue between the United States and Iraq. The meetings are an opportunity to reaffirm our joint commitment to security cooperation and regional stability and continue discussions on further developing Iraq's security and defense capabilities. Will they discuss the U.S. Uh, forces presence in, uh, in Iraq? So I don't want to get into it in detail. We'll have a statement that comes out after the meeting, but uh, we do remain committed to the higher military commission process that began in August. Um, I think, as you know, that process is to determine how the coalition's military mission will transition based on threat from ISIS, operational and environmental requirements, the capabilities 
uh, of Iraqi security forces, um, but I don't have any, any further detail to give on And finally, that. when uh, will the meetings uh, be uh, done? Um, I would defer to the Defense Department. They are the actual hosts of the meeting. They are this week in, in Washington, but with respect to specific timing, I would defer to them to, to speak to it. Thank you. I met uh, two questions. Uh, former President Trump said last week that uh, he got along well with North Korean leader Kim Jong Un, and he said it is good to get along well with a country that has many nuclear weapons. As you know, North Korea has continued to develop nuclear weapons, and uh, WMD even while engaging in along with the United States and North Korea or South and North Korea in the past. How would you comment on about getting along with the dictator Kim Jong-un? Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> I typically prefer not to comment on campaign matters from, from this podium. And uh, also North Korea is already threatening the Korean Peninsula with uh, nuclear weapons as well as international community. North Korea is also demanding a price to give up its nuclear weapons. Do you think that if we get along well with North Korea, North Korea will give up its nuclear weapons? So I'm not going to speak to um, uh, comments that were made in the course of the campaign, which I know that's a question asking me to respond to. Um, but I will repeat, as I've said before, we have made clear um, on a number of occasions that we prefer diplomacy to deal with this uh, situation, and the North Koreans have shown that they are not in any way interested in that. Okay. Yeah. Was there any talk of a shift of priorities or is there any hope or less hope for accomplishing some certain goals for this administration now that there's a six month condensed timeline for its existence? Uh, no talk of shifting priorities. In fact, just the opposite. Uh, as I said, the secretary telling the team that he wants all of them to continue to focus on the priorities that we have been working on. Obviously, if you look across the world, it will be um, continuing to deepen our partners, uh, our, our partnerships in the Indo-Pacific region as part of what the secretary is doing. Uh, on this trip that he will uh, undertake at the end of this week into next week, but there's other work that happens uh, at the levels below him. That's uh, continuing to hold Russia accountability for uh, accountable for its aggression against Ukraine, and it's working to achieve a ceasefire and ultimately lasting stability uh, and security in the Middle East. And but that those obviously aren't the only things. You look across every bureau of this department, they have things that they're working on. And the secretary's mission is keep focused, keep at it, and work as hard as possible to run through the tape. Uh, you think that massive killings going on in Bangladesh, as you know, but Bangladesh security forces given shot on sight, and nobody knows the death toll, uh, internet shutdowns for 50 days today, and its death toll crosses hundreds, and government is uh, using su that Supreme Court, control Supreme Court, to uh, control the voices of the students. So it's uh, just, um, you know, an unthinkable situation. And the, I saw the many members of the Congress, human rights organization, asking it to, and expressing their solidarity with the student movement. Nobel laureate Professor Muhammad Yunus urged the world leaders, including US and United Nations, to act promptly to rescue the Bangladeshi people and the democratic rights. So what is your comment on this? So we are closely following developments in Bangladesh. We continue to calm for a call for calm and de-escalation. De uh, we condemn all recent acts of violence in Bangladesh uh, and reiterate our unwavering support for peaceful assembly. In addition, we remain deeply concerned by reports of ongoing telecommunications disruptions across the country, which limit the ability of people in Bangladesh, including American citizens, to access critical information. We call on the government to restore internet ser uh, service. We condemn the reported shoot on site orders that have been given uh, and call for those to be rescinded. Uh, and of course, I would just, um, as a final thought with respect to the situation, reiterate that media freedom is an essential building block of a thriving democracy, it is essential that 
journalists in Bangladesh, as is true everywhere in the world, be able to function freely. One thing uh, is, one, and I, I, just don't, no interruptions, just and one I'll, at a time. You know, the, the Bangladeshi uh, people are protesting everywhere in the world, you know, in front of the State Department, White House, Times Square. But the UAE, when they are protesting in the uh, Dubai, in some places in UAE, they sentence 57 Bangladeshi for 11 years why they are protesting against their own government. So what is your comment? And finally, do you rely on Bangladesh regime as you are calling and urging that we entertain your call and urge, you know? As we see in the last 15 years, Bangladesh is run by authoritarian regime and they are trying to keep their power by any means using the security forces. So with respect to the first question, I wasn't aware of that report, so I'm reluctant to comment on it as always in the case. We don't have perfect information here, but when it comes to the government in Bangladesh, um, uh, it's a government with which we've worked on a number of issues, but we also make clear when we have concerns, as I believe I just did. One follow-up. Thank you so much for uh, saying. Uh, I know that you will tell already that you told, but uh, the uh, widespread uh, violent protest happened in Bangladesh uh, recent days, and already Bangladesh Supreme Court on Sunday rolled back most of the controversial, controversial quotas on government jobs. Uh, that is, uh, they now uh, send back to the government that uh, uh, this quota system they should uh, change and they are taking this this time maybe they're uh, giving the rolling from uh, government uh, would be 93 percent of government job will be free for the uh, for without quotas but uh, i my question already my colleague asked, asked about that I, I want you to comment on that i will write it in light of recent sentencing of three bangladeshi to life in prison in united Arab Emirate. Just they were protesting uh, in, in at what happening in Bangladesh. How does the State Department view the development in terms of human rights and diplomatic relation between the United Arab Emirates, Bangladesh, and the United States? Additionally, what step, if any, in the United Sta State Department considering to address the broader issue of the treatment of foreign workers in the United Arab Emirates so, and Saudi Arabia. Well, let me just say, so I said 60 seconds ago, I yeah. wasn't aware of that specific report. I obviously didn't sneak out of, out of the room and read about it between the time he asked his question, you asked yours. So uh, I'm still unaware of that specific report, so can't comment on it in any detail. No, this just, this, that, and did you have, did you have a, another one? Yeah, just uh, if you have a comment on the, the ruling of Bangladesh Supreme Court that, uh, to that. Oh, with, no, with, no, because with respect to the underlying quota system and, and whether it goes forward, whether it's rescinded, that's an internal matter for Bangladesh to decide. Where we feel the need to speak out is on uh, uh, acts of violence, on the shutdown of the internet, and other thing that, things that impact fundamental uh, human rights, human dignity, human freedom. Thank you so much. Uh, the current situation in Bangladesh, is the military is taking over the power now? Where do you have coming in that? I, I, just I think the military have, is taking over. I just don't have an assessment of that. Uh, Matt, how are you? My name is Jacob Milton. I'm representing. I'm good. Thanks Weird. for asking. No one ever does Thank that. You. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Almost your colleagues don't care about my uh, my uh, underlying my underlying feelings up here. They, they're they're quite indifferent to them. I, I, in fact, <laughs> we all we all. I, I would not. Of course, the feeling is not mutual. I well, care about all of your yeah. Your we all underline. Uh, Matt, stats. so far about thousand people are being slaughtered, and another thousand two thousand people become the victim of enforced disappearance by the government forces in Bangladesh. Also, there is a eyewitness news and my reporter in the border. There is infiltration of Indian forces and Humvees, military vehicle inside Bangladesh, aiding Bangladesh police, RAV, and BGB uh, in enforcing, enforced uh, killing and enforced disappearance, extrajudicial killing and and for disappearance. Other than general awareness, other, other than general concern of America, does America have any plan to take the side of Bangladeshi people to protect them, protect their right? So as I just said, we condemn all acts of violence and we condemn acts of violence no matter who they are perpetrated by or perpetrated against. And so of course we stand with the Bangladeshi people. Um, we support freedom of assembly. We support peaceful protest. But when it comes to acts of violence, whether they be whether they be commi committed by people conducting protests or by government authorities, we condemn them in all instances. Okay, uh, Matt. Last thing I would like to discuss: Secretary Blinken he is visiting <laughs> South Asia. 
he is concerned, he is very much showing solidarity with the people of South Asia, and that is really a very good thing for the Asian people. Now, to protect America's national interest in Bangladesh, people views if there is a caretaker government under the leadership of Dr. Mohammed Yunus with a strong ties with US government and European Union, Bangladeshi people may have their right back to cast their vote and they would like to see the peaceful uh, society in the country. I know America is aware and concerned, uh, but awareness and concern did not stop. Thousands of people are getting killed, thousands are getting uh, disappearing from their house. Is there anything else that people can expect from America? So we will continue to make our concerns clear. We will continue to speak with our partners in the international community about concerns that we have. But when it comes to, um, it's not so much the premises of your question, but it's some, uh, uh, a point that you raised as opposed to alternative leadership in Bangladesh, that ultimately is a question for the Bangladeshi people, not the United States of America. Going back to the ceasefire deal, actually, Secretary's remarks, the 10-yard line, was on Friday just before Sunday, President Biden's decision to draw back to place. Now, Prime Minister Netanyahu arrives in a very politically uncertain environment. I say, I feel dots being connected here that don't necessarily connect, but go ahead. Maybe I should, go ahead. I should make sure. No, I, I would just, yeah. I, I'd just like to ask, should we still uh, expect that ceasefire deal put forward by President Biden stand as effective as it would be, given he's not running for the second term now? Because there are reports yeah. that that Prime Minister Netanyahu might be dragging his feet until November to see so, who would be the next president of the United States. So absolutely. And I think you have to remember that when the president outlined that proposal publicly, it was a proposal that had been put forward by the government of Israel. It was Israel's proposal. We had obviously been involved in the development of that proposal as our role in one of the mediators to the negotiations, but it was ultimately an Israeli proposal. Now, um, as I said in, in response to that, whose question it was earlier, we continue to be involved in those negotiations and trying to move them forward to get them across the line. And what we have seen is, uh, on behalf of the Israeli government, is uh, them engaging, also trying to get a final deal. Now, there are things that they have put forward that ultimately are difficult, just as there are things that, that Hamas has put forward that are difficult to resolve. But we believe that ultimately those all ought to be resolvable. Again, always with the caveat, that doesn't mean they will be resolved. Negotiations are tough, and I think the Secretary said, uh, on Friday, that sometimes the last 10 yards is are, uh, can be the hardest length to cover. But we have made important progress, and we continue to push to try and get it over the line. So it can be, fin can be finished. It would be the hardest to cover, but it doesn't take three days. I mean, that's a pretty crappy red line, a red zone offense. Uh, so if, if you... If you, if you three, four days now? So if you look at how long we have been involved in these negotiations, this is not a 60, the, the analogy does not carry over to a 60 minute football game. We've been involved in these negotiations for some time, uh, going back months. If you, like an eight back, month, or nine months. Going back months game. is obviously, uh, uh, Sounds more like a, 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 a cricket test match than it does a, Here you go with cricket again. Te now the, testing my cricket knowledge again. <laughs> well, let's talk water polo then. De definitely so not. Go, you don't have go. any concerns that the process would be slower now, given the president is not running for a second term because no, of the I, uncertainty I, for a second term? I, I do not. Look, ultimately, we believe a ceasefire deal is in the interest of the government of Israel. It's in the interest of the Palestinian people. Um, that's why it ought to be agreed to, and we'll continue to push for it as, uh, as hard as we can. Thank now, you. Eva, go ahead. Uh, yeah, go ahead. The, the meeting between uh, the Prime Minister and the President doesn't take place tomorrow, or before that uh, Secretary traveled to Asia. Do we expect a separate meeting between Secretary of Lincoln and Netanyahu? Uh, I just don't. I, I, it's hard for me to answer that without knowing when the meeting with the Prime Minister is going to be scheduled. So. Um, before I get into what I would expect, if something doesn't happen, I'm, uh, I think I'll wait and see what it actually does. Ask me on Wednesday if it hasn't happened. Um, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. How are you doing, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You've been very kind today, and, uh, and I am very emotional, guys. So if you're going to be this down, the next three, four months are going to be very tough for me. So please cheer up. It's you know, still a few months I to go. I didn't know I was... <laughs> I don't know. Was, you know uh, so Pakistani parents. embassy in Germany was attacked by uh, these Afghans kids and they uh, ripped off the flag as well. Uh, uh, your reaction on that? Uh, and then uh, 
connecting it with the last week question a little bit, uh, Pakistani journalists are condemning that the uh, Voice of America had given so much coverage to uh, that day when the funeral was held and, you know, kids were walking with Afghan flag in Pakistan. But to this incident uh, where in Germany, Pakistani embassy was attacked, flag torn down and uh, tried to burn it. Your reaction on both of these So things, with respect to the underlying incident, let me take it back and get you an answer. With respect to Voice of America's coverage, Voice of America uh, uh, is an independent outlet that makes its own editorial decisions. Any concerns that people have, they should direct to them, not the State Department. diplomatic relations. Uh, you should, they make independent editorial decisions and you should direct any questions to them. Um, just one question more, please. Uh, and because this question, me and you have talked about it so much, uh, not as much as in uh, President Trump in his speech had mentioned two things which I have been raising with you multiple times. Uh, and uh, in Pentagon as well. Uh, 14 U.S. soldiers who died the last day. Uh, and I asked for inquiry at the Pentagon. My issue was that the U.S. was already withdrawing. There was no ambassador of State Department at that time in Afghanistan. Uh, the second thing I've been raising with you and uh, Mr. Kirby is the weapons left there. Uh, Mr. Trump mentioned it as well. Now, the other thing is Reuters mentioned, again, this issue I've mentioned with you, that the U.S. funds to Afghanistan may have landed into the wrong hands as well. All these three issues, just I want to give you again an opportunity to at least uh, give your opinion or thoughts about it in a more... Uh, uh, the, 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 if you want a different answer, you're not going to get one. With respect to the uh, to weapons, I would defer to my colleagues at the Pentagon, obviously, who I think you said you've raised that question before. They're the appropriate agency to speak to that. Um, when it comes to U.S. funding of the Taliban, no, we flatly do not fund the Taliban. We made that clear on a number of occasions. Just a follow-up on yeah. Netanyahu. Has there been any engagement or discussion with Israelis regarding Netanyahu's expected remarks to Congress on Wednesday? Um, not that I'm aware of. I'm sure it may have come up anecdotally, obviously. We talked to the, the uh, Israeli government all the time, but no, I, I'm, uh, I'm not aware of what he's uh, going to say. So, Alex, go ahead, and then Jenny, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, we have Russian officials over the weekend stating on the record that Russia is, quote, prepared to assist the ruling Georgian Dream Party if in, in maintaining power if required. Any concern about Russian attempts to meddle with the Georgian economy? Look, so we have seen a number of Russian, uh, not just attempts, but we've seen outright Russian interference in elections all throughout the region and all throughout the world. We are always uh, vigilant in watching those. And uh, as you've heard us say on a number of occasions, it is important that the Georgian people and the Georgian people alone decide the future of their country. Thank you. I'm on Armenia. I want to give you about today's EU decision to start both the visa free dialogue and also supporting uh, uh, this funding uh, from the European Peace Fund. Its implications for our uh, So, Armenia and Azerbaijan continue to make significant progress toward finalizing a peace agreement. We are committed to supporting that process, as you have said, heard us say. The time for peace is now, and we continue to work to try to reach an agreement. Mm -hmm. Any this is, this is a decision about the uh, I, I don't know the specific. Uh, fired on by Israeli forces in Gaza. Has the Israeli government given you any information about this incident? Are you we have, asking for We have inquired with them about uh, this strike. I do not have any information about it as of yet. If it's, if it's made it back to us, it hasn't made it to me. This is happening as you guys have touted this new deconfliction mechanism. How, how do you make it that it's safe for humanitarian convoys to move forward if even this is okay? So look, it is always going to be, uh, anytime you're in a conflict zone, it's always going to be uh, difficult to proceed with humanitarian work. And what we try to do is to make it as safe as possible, recognizing that this is still work that's happening in, happening in a conflict zone, which is why you hear us speak uh, on a number of occasions to the enormous sacrifice and the enormous risk that uh, humanitarian workers um, uh, put themselves uh, under. And so we have kind of two tracks on this. One is trying to work with the uh, United Nations to try to make it as safe as possible. The secretary spoke to Sigrid Cog, the UN coordinator for uh, Middle East humanitarian issues earlier today about a number of humanitarian issues, including this. Um, but we also work, uh, continue to work to try to get a ceasefire. The other um, significant um, uh, line of work that the secretary spoke to, to uh, Sigrid Cog about today was how we get all the mechanisms in place so if we do reach a ceasefire, 
humanitarian aid can surge into Gaza as quickly as possible. And obviously, in the context of a ceasefire, it would be much safer for them to move about Gaza and um, do the work that they need to do without uh, worrying so much about their, their personal safety. Is there any discussion of punitive measures for Israel if they continue to knowingly fire on March humanitarian uh, I don't have anything to, to read out at this time. We did that. Thanks. Thank you.